Hey guys, this is Slender Magic here, and it's finally time to talk some more about Kaladesh because the release date is coming up soon, but way more importantly, the pre-release is coming up soon. Now, if you've never gone to a pre-release, do not be intimidated. This is not like going to a Grand Prix or something where it's all official and deck lists and judges and shuffle methods and, you know, all that. It's like super, super casual. Even the most competitive players do not consider this all that competitive because... Um, as good of a player as you are, and as good at building a deck as you might be, it does tend to come down to what rare and mythic bombs did you pull. I literally built my entire deck around one card. It was like, draw, scry, Gisela. Every time I got her out, I won the game. Every time I didn't get her out, I lost the game. My, it was a single-purpose suicide draw stall deck. I had pin down removal, creature preservation, obviously and just draw scry that's it it was just get to gisela like 40 cards get to her it was a really stupid idea but it worked i absolutely dominated i went uh three out of four rounds the round i lost i couldn't get out gisela uh definitely a dumb way to build a deck but if you think about it um 40 cards minus the seven that you start with you might even mulligan once to make sure that you can get her and i, I still don't really know the math that well i don't have it memorized as far as draw seven then mulligan then six but from the same pool over get and multiply those together what your probability of starting with gisela are if she's one out of 40 but it's reasonable and then you look at okay there's 33 cards left in the deck and i'm gonna draw one per turn so she's in there somewhere if you have no particular reason to shuffle and she's on the bottom, you're screwed, though. So, everybody knows you pull a bomb, you win. But, let's assume you don't. Because you probably won't. I mean, if you get, like, a Gear Hulk or Chandra, like, those are pretty good. I mean, you're you're probably going to win just based on that. I mean, there's not, like, a Gisela good card, necessarily. But some of them are pretty darn close. So what I like to do is first look at the uncommons because you're going to get, let's see, six packs, all of them from Kaladesh, three uncommons each. That's 18 potential cards. So you can't really count on saying, oh, I hope I pull this one, but it's a lot more common than the rare. And uncommons do tend to be just a hair better than the commons. Now, that's great and all, but you want to look at a whole concept before you pick your color or colors. It's almost always going to be two color. You can't just say, oh, I pulled, you know, console shield guard, I'm going white. It's not quite that good. No matter how good an uncommon is, it's not that good. You've got to look at the rest of the cards, but you need to identify just the game-disrupting bombs. Um, and obviously, they're not as good as, like, a mythic, but, you know, I'm calling them bombs. They're just good cards, really, really good limited cards. Because that should definitely skew your decision. I mean, you could put in some so-so just block cards, you know, put in like 10 of them or whatever to finish up your colors. If you have good enough cards in there that, that made it worthwhile. Like something where, like, with just the best evasion, the best persistence. Like, for example, Eternal Scourge. I put it on my list last time, I would put it on my list again. In Limited, now not in Constructed, it wasn't even very good in Constructed at all. But in Limited, a creature where pretty much every time they try to kill it, it just comes right back, that is a problem. That is a really big problem. That's like a planeswalker size problem. Once that comes out, they are getting hit for three damage every single turn until they either chump block and lose one or two creatures, or they're going to have to burn a, a, like a spell to maybe pin it down, because as soon as they try to kill it, it goes to exile, and then you can summon it right back. I mean, it's kind of like pulling Relentless Dead. If you pulled Relentless Dead, that thing was sticking around for a long time. And if you can keep stuff on the field and dodge the very little bit of uh, removal and control that your opponents have, that's huge. So just as a basic rule, anything with Hexproof, anything with, you know, protection from colors or anything like that, really, really good card. Anything that returns from the graveyard, anything that casts itself twice, you know, kind of like a rebound type of thing automatically a better card than your average card, almost regardless of what it does. It does have to do something pretty good, but the fact that it counts as like two cards or like it counts as like three creatures because it's just going to keep coming back out of the graveyard, now we're talking. But of course, this isn't a general video, it's a specific video. So here are the best uncommons that you can possibly pull. And let me just preface it by saying these are standalone good. I'm not mentioning anything about synergy because first of all you're not going to have any it's pre-release it's limited you got to work with the cards you got to work with and you usually narrow down to two colors so synergy not really i mean i saw some lucky people get red black vampire madness to work i mean they had some synergy that was a miracle 
But if you see something like that, if you're like, wow, I pulled all elves and a bunch of cards that boost elves. Yeah, go elves. I mean, yeah. That's like such a given that I'm not going to say, oh, this is perfect if you pulled other elves. Yeah, that's, it's obvious. So just looking at the card standalone, is it good? That's what I'm basing it off of. Oh, and like I said, a lot of these cards probably absolutely suck in Constructed. I'm only referring to Limited. In fact, I'm not even talking about Draft. This is just straight up sealed pre-release. Let's start with Console's Shield Guard because it costs four. Uh, three of them are colorless or generic. I got to stop calling it that. So it goes well in a mixed color. That's, you know, one good thing. When it comes out, you automatically get two energy counters and you can spend them on anything. But he's a self-contained energy counter user because he has an ability. Uh, whenever he attacks, you may pay one energy counter. And if you do, another target attacking creature gains indestructible until end of turn. So that's always a threat. So he's a little late coming out, but he's a 3-4. Definitely worth... I mean, if he was just a blank 3-4 for 4, that would be like an okay card, just size-wise. But you bring him out, and there's always that threat. You know, you're swinging, and they know, oh, if I chump block, he's just going to make them indestructible. So they basically have to just wait for you to do it twice. <laughs> Otherwise, they, they their blocking assignments get really, really complicated. So he can just, when he comes out, he will dominate the attack swings. Next up is a reprint, Diabolic Tutor. I mean, this is so obvious. It is double black. You got to watch out for that. It is a sorcery. It does cost four. But... Once you're at that point, and you're maybe kind of starting to get close to top decking, or maybe the game's kind of turning around, or maybe you're about to win but you need to drive it home, you could go through your entire library and go get the best card, the best mythic, the best rare, whatever, whatever you need at that exact point. If you're already winning the game, you could go blue-black and just go get a counterspell. So you could just handpick something out of your... Um, library and instead of going on the top of your library and then you might accidentally shuffle or they'll cause you to shuffle uh it goes straight to your hand this is only an okay card in constructed because it's, it's just so slow and wastes so much mana you basically give up your whole turn but you do that in limited with uh, four mana on the field it's probably like turn seven turn eight you can totally get away with it and then boom you went and fetched gisela or a planeswalker or i mean there's no restriction it's not even a creature it's just any card hell you could go get a land i don't know why you would but you could I mean, if you're that badly color screwed, the way I tell people about this card is, yeah, you lose a turn, but in limited, not the biggest deal, usually. But Diabolic Tutor is like an exact clone of the best card in your deck, because now you could either draw that card, or you could draw Diabolic Tutor and then go get that card. Could you imagine pulling two Gisellas? I mean, holy crap. Now, Gear Shift Ace is another one that I want to highlight, because... A 2-1 first striker is a 2-1 first striker. He only costs 2. It's not double white. Ignore the rest. Who cares if you even draw a vehicle? 2 damage first strike is pretty powerful because if you have like a 3-2 that you're going up against, you just killed them. They can't stop you. Now, historically, like a 1-3, a 1-4 with first strike, they're crap. I mean, they, they can only use their first strike if they're going up against something that has one toughness. And if they are, who cares? But 2 first strike... That's huge, especially when he only costs two. And then he might grant a vehicle first strike if you can get a vehicle. Nice side effect. He, he's just a good card to put in. Super cheap, super fast, super high combat capabilities, and that will help you. Next up, we've got, oh yes, another one, Harsh Scrutiny. The fact that I absolutely despise Thoughtseize, Duress, um, Despise... Inquisition of Kaza, like you name it, I hate it. If it removes one of my cards that you get to choose, I hate it. You know why I hate it? Because it's really good. I'm so sick of playing against it because I could have like God's gift to an opening hand and then they go and ruin it. Now imagine that a limited where half the cards they're holding are crap and then you get rid of their mythic for one mana. Now it does have to be a creature card, but creatures tend to win games. It's really hard to get like some weird alternate thing going in limited. It's usually just who can bring out the biggest creature or creatures and then bash each other in the face. I mean, somebody might pull off tokens or something on these side little, you know, things, but it's usually just creature fight. So you get to see their entire hand, um, and you know what other spells they have. Then you get to choose whatever creature card you feel is most powerful. No limit on minimum, maximum power, toughness, none of that. And then they discard it, and then you scry one to potentially maybe fix your next turn. And you can fix your next turn after seeing what's in their hand. For one mana. This is in my top three so far. This is, that's like game winning, like by itself, solo game winning. You get rid of the best card in their hand that's a creature and then make sure that your next card doesn't suck. You are at such an advantage, it's insane. The only problem is 
if you pull this late game, it's practically useless because people get to top decking really quick and limited. And if they have a giant creature, they're probably going to hold it unless they don't have enough mana. And then it's not that big of a problem until they get enough mana. Durable Handicraft is kind of a crappy version of Always Watching, but it is um, generic plus one green. It's only two. It's an enchantment, which is, you know, reasonably hard to get rid of in limited. I mean, it's not like people have four enchantment removals in their deck. Like, why would they do that? So, whatever creature enters the battlefield under your control, you just pay one extra, doesn't even matter the color, and then you put a 1-1 counter on it. So, all your creatures are one bigger, theoretically, than your opponents, all things being equal. That's game winning. I mean, it's just simple as that. All your 3-3s are 4-4s, and all their 3-3s are still 3-3s. Yeah, you've got to have the mana, but if you start chucking out dirt cheap creatures, there you go. So, I would not put that in a deck with expensive creatures, but if you get, you know, cheap, kind of blitzy creatures, I would definitely put this in. Plus... In a bad situation, you can just dump counters on everybody for six and blow up the enchantment. So definitely pretty good because, you know, if, if your alternative is to just chuck out, you know, three two, two twos, three threes, whatever, and hope they win, it's not quite as good as making them all one bigger. Now, I'm going to include Ministry of Inquiries for one reason. He's a one, two for one, and he is blue. I mean, that's pretty good combat abilities for blue. It's not great. Wish he had three toughness. He could only really block a one, one, but... You know, whatever. His ability sucks. Never do that. You are equally likely to hit a card that they don't need as a card that they do need. Sort of. That's a drastic oversimplification, but the philosophy is correct. But hey, one, two for two. Oh, and also free energy counters on top of it. Now, Aether Meltdown, you're going to need it. If you're going blue, you're going to need some kind of control, and it's always either bounce back to hand or pin down. Those are kind of their things. So Aether Meltdown for two, it's a pin down. I mean, it's not a good pin down because it can still block, but you do get two energy. So there, there's really only two classifications of pin down. Um, can it still block and can it not still block? Like, does it tap down and remain tapped? You know, there's a million different versions of it, claustrophobia and all that. But this does only cost two and it's, it's um, half generic mana. So it'll at least stop a threat up to about negative four. And honestly, if it was a five, five, well, now it's a one, five. So your creatures aren't necessarily still getting through unless you went like all flyers or something, but it has flash, so you could do it while they wasted their swing, and then maybe counter swing. So they waste their biggest creature, you plop that on them, and then you get two energy. So definitely a decent pin down. Considering it costs two instead of three, I'll take the fact that they can still block. Now let's talk about make obsolete, or as I like to call it, fester gloom except better. It's only creatures your opponent's control there is so much you can do with this card and it's an instant the unspeakable power of this this is single cast game win but only under very specific circumstances let's break it down one kills tokens well one one tokens two kills all creatures with one toughness three kills all creatures that took two damage and have three toughness so after combat slip this in and goodbye Four, you can use it as a block ambush. Now their entire line that they're um, either blocking with or attacking with, honestly, it doesn't matter. Their whole line of creatures is smaller and it doesn't affect yours in any way. This is an insane ambush. I mean, I wish it was like, I don't know, zero, negative two. That would be a little bit better, but that would be like OP as crap. I mean, you could kill anything with that. I mean, considering like Drown and Sorrows killed your own creatures, um, Languish kills your own creatures... Bile Blight didn't, but that had to match. Fester Gloom would kill your own creatures if they weren't black. I mean, this is the best, like, sweep that I've seen in quite a while. This would have some use in Constructed. It's that good. And remember, black double generic, so you will be able to get it off consistently if you're playing two colors. Hopefully. I really hope you don't get color screwed. You have my anti-color screwed blessing. Now, Spark of Creativity is really good dirt cheap red removal. It is a sorcery, but I mean, it's one mana. It's not really going to affect your turn that much. So it says, choose target creature. Then, after that, after you've chosen the creature, and I guarantee the ruling says you have to do that first, but I mean, come on, chronological order, exile the top card of your library. So you flip it up, look at it, exile it. You may have Spark of Creativity, so the spell itself, deal damage to that creature that you already chose equal to the exiled card's converted mana cost. So if it's a land, zero. That's a shame. Anything else, probably getting hit for one, two, three, four, or five. So if you choose not to have it deal damage to the creature equal to the um, converted mana cost, instead, you may play that card until end of turn. So if it's really, really big, like it's a five cost, you probably can't afford it, 
so you could just hit them with the five. If it's really cheap, it's probably not big enough to kill the target creature because you chose their best creature, and then you can cast it for one. I mean, it's it's like card draw in red for one. Now, if you flip up your, your like, five-cost super mythic or whatever, um, and then you lose it and you can't cast it, that kind of sucks, but then you did get rid of a creature, so that is just insanely powerful. Probably the best removal in all of red that I've seen so far. Spoiler alert, I haven't read hardly any of the spoilers. I'm probably wrong. Now let's talk about Nature's Way, possibly the best boost in all of, I don't know, Uncommon Kaladesh Green, which is obviously a bit of a small pool. That tiger's obviously been rolling around in freshly cut grass, but that doesn't stop the card from being awesome. But it's massively misleading. It doesn't say Force Fight, which would be even more misleading, um, unless you know the rules and watch my channel. But um, target creature you control gains Vigilance and Trample till end of turn. Okay, completely separate. Then, it deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. So they don't actually fight. You have zero chance of losing your creature. You could take out a Death Toucher, doesn't matter. They don't touch it. You literally just take its power and then deal it to the target creature you don't control. So do it to your most powerful creature, especially when it's temporarily boosted. That'd be cool. Otherwise, you know, a 3-1, a 3-2, a 4-4, something huge. Probably take out a creature. Oh, now go to combat. Your creature has Vigilance and Trample. And you probably picked a really, really big creature. And it's one green plus one generic, so, you know, color screwedness again. It's flexible, it's it's green creature removal, basically. And then you get to still leave your biggest creature with Vigilance on defense to block and trample at the same time. I mean, it's just insane, but it's practically useless until late game when you get something big out. It's so good, though. Who cares about timing? Now, a lot of people do not appreciate Fairgrounds Warden because they aren't thinking of it correctly. When it enters the battlefield, exile target creature and opponent controls until uh, the card itself leaves the battlefield. It's a 1-3 for 3. That's kind of crappy. Normally, it would probably cost 2. Guess what the extra mana is for? The fact that it's like a free, I don't know, silk wraps and I can't name any of the white exile because I haven't built a deck like that. Stasis Snare, that's one. That Stasis Snare, that one's awesome. Stasis Snare may have a uh, flash, but it's double white and still costs three, and you don't get a creature. Now, the downside is, this is a creature. It's a lot easier to destroy than an enchantment. It is a 1-3, so even if they tried to, like, force fight or something, that's a lot of toughness to get past. One creature down, you're up one creature. That's a two-creature difference with one spell. It's basically a so-so kind of dumpy creature with a free exile spell built in. Do not underestimate the importance of that. Removing opponent's creatures is like the holy grail of limited because there's just not that many good creatures to go around because their deck sucks. Notice there's no power limit. No no maximum toughness, maximum power, none of that. You could get rid of a 10-10 creature. It just doesn't matter. Now, if you get rid of a creature with counters and then they blow up your warden, they get the creature back with no counters. It also strips off equipment, auras, whatever. Doesn't matter, it's gone. I mean, the equipment is left standing there, but still, they'd have to re-equip it. Inventor's Apprentice beats the last crappy card that was a 1-2 for 1. This one might be a 2-3, and all you have to do is uh, control an artifact, which, even in Limited, is pretty likely to happen. You might get out an artifact accidentally without building an artifact type of deck. 2-3 for 1? I'll take it, plus it's a human artificer. Potential synergy there. Absolute automatic include if you're already going red. Blossoming Defense? Oh. My. God, it only costs one in an instant. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? Mythicspoilers.com that I'm reading this from. Are you kidding me? Plus two, plus two, as an instant, no limit, no requirement, and it gains hexproof until end of turn. That costs one mana. You guys remember the really, really powerful card, Ranger's Guile? This is two of it. God, I hope people don't put this in infect, but I feel like they might. I mean, it's kind of low on damage, but, eh, you know, hexproof. Maybe a sideboard card. Now, Disappearing Act is really crappy. It's double blue, which means it's pretty hard to cast, and then obviously the generic, so it's actually three. It is an instant. It's basically a really garbage version of Cancel, which I don't like garbage versions of Cancel, but I haven't seen a whole lot of blue counterspells so far. The only way that this is better than Cancel... Because it says, as an additional cost, um, you have to return a permanent you control to its owner's hands. Not a creature, a permanent. If that permanent has an enter the battlefield effect, you can now do it again. So, 
kind of circumstantial. You have to cast this in response to them casting the spell, so the timing is not up to you. It's, you know, not to their knowledge, but up to them. I don't love it, but if I had a whole bunch of ETB cards, I would definitely put this in. Bare minimum, you might get to drop in two extra energy counters or something. Who knows? Now let's talk about Aetherborn Marauder. It does cost four, but of course, you know, the very generous, you know, non-double black is a single black, three of anything else, so very flexible. Uh, that late in the game, when you got four, you're probably not going to still be color screwed if you're still in the game at that point. He's in the air, so he's not likely to be blocked. He's a 2-2. Two -two. And he's got lifelink. That's two life every single turn. I would pay four just for that. If you're negative twoing your opponent while plus twoing you in limited, that is huge. He can move counters to himself. Okay. I mean, that's like insane, but you'd have to have counters on the field. So if you're not playing a counter deck, whatever, he's still good enough to include just because of the whole plus two minus two thing. I just love cards like this because they're just detrimental enough to the board state that somebody has to do something about it or they're going to really start losing the game. But he's not really worthy of, of like a creature removal because there's not that much of it to go around. So you usually force them to blow him up and then you bring out like some gargantuan 5-5 or something. And then they're out of removal. Oops. These type of cards are usually called lightning rods. But I specifically call the subgenre lightning decoys. A mythic gear hulk is a lightning rod. We're back to green again, and this one is just as insane. Green is, oh my gosh, they got all the good uncommons. Long Tusk Cub. Cost two, not even both green. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, it gets two energy counters, and then at any time, without even tapping it or anything, doesn't even matter the tap state, anything, you may pay two energy counters and put a 1-1 one -one counter on Long Tusk Cub. That's not a 1-1 one -one bonus talent of turn, that is forever. Keep in mind, you can get energy counters from pretty much any other source. Doesn't have to come from him. You can just drop him in and plus five him. I would really wait until summoning sickness wears off to do that, but you get the idea. This could become a problem immediately, and honestly, just a 2-2 two -two for two is okay. Next up, we've got a beautiful artwork of uh, Sky Whaler taking a shot at a social justice warrior. It removes a giant creature, then describe one. It's an instant. I mean, that's it. If it's lower than three power, you probably didn't want to blow it up anyway. You could sit with this from your opening hand all the way to turn 20 and um, then use it and just get rid of their biggest threat. And then <laughs> reload, scry one, load her up. Creature removal, baby, and this is not the worst of it. Now, Harness Lightning is pretty simple. Choose target creature, you get three energy counters. Then you may pay any amount of energy counters. Harness Lightning deals that much damage to that creature. So... Bare minimum, you're doing three damage as an instant, only single red, then single generic, so two cost. Not even all red. Can you get that there's a theme here that you really shouldn't understate the fact that it's not, you know, requiring double the same color when you're probably playing two colors? So it deals three damage, maybe more. I mean, it's kind of a synergy card, but honestly, three damage for two as an instant, I'll take just that. Here's the kicker. If you have a better use for your energy cards, um... It says you may pay any amount of energy counters. Uh, zero is any amount. Basically just gain three energy counters and then do nothing. Super flexible, super cheap. It's an instant. I love it. I even love the artwork. Then there's Arborback Stomper. It costs five. At that point, we're at double green, but we don't care. Uh, it's a 5-4 with Trample when it enters the battlefield to gain five life. I mean, I don't even need to explain why that's good. That late in the game, you aren't at 20. Trust me. Five damage Trample... Your opponent's probably not at 20 either. Oh, and you can return it to the battlefield over and over and over with Flicker. Oh my gosh. Okay, that's synergy with other cards and other mechanics. I said I wouldn't comment on that. Consulate Surveillance. You get four free energy counters. It only costs four. I mean, that's up there, but whatever. But then you can pay two. So you can automatically do this twice, even if you have no other energy generation in your entire deck. Then, prevent all damage that would be dealt to you but, uh, this turn by a source of your choice. So they swing with something that they think is pretty awesome, and now it's no longer a blocker, assuming it doesn't have Vigilance. There you go. Prevent all damage. Let it right through. Who cares? If they're really stupid, once you let it through, they'll boost it, and then you'll activate this. But it's sitting on the battlefield. I mean, come on. How dumb is your opponent? The fact that you can do this twice, and you don't have to tap it so you can do it twice on the same turn, that's pretty funny. If you load up like 10 energy counters and this hits the battlefield, it would be pretty hard to lose the game. Oh my god, we're back at green again, the Pima Outrider. There we go, double green. Finally, they realize that this is so good that they might as well make you maybe not able to cast it, maybe. Well, in multicolor, I mean. Uh, let's just go ahead and say he's going to be a 4-4 with Trample, because why the hell would I need some dumpy artifact when I could have him be a 4-4 with Trample? 
But if you really need an artifact, because you've got a bunch of other cards that say, if you control an artifact, well, okay. But, I mean, a 4-4 Trampler, come on, for four? He's also an elf and he's also an artificer? Sign me up. Now it's time for Aerial Responder. Double white. It should be, this is insane. People think the costs are just random or it's for devotion. Or, come on, really? It's because they want to make it so that it's perfect in a mono white deck and a lot harder to consistently get out in a two color deck, especially in sealed, because you can't just say, oh, I'm going to put in four of my color fixing lands. If you have three men on the field and one is a plains and two are a forest, you cannot bring this guy out. And that's the weakness. But holy balls, he's a 2-3 flying vigilance lifelinker. Holy crap. It's Gisela's, like, weird one-eyed uncle. It's a giant flying blocker. It never has to tap when it attacks. It's free life points every single turn. This is, like, the ultimate white creature. You bring this guy out on turn three, it's gonna be 30 to 10 pretty darn quick. Now, Oval Chase Daredevil, I don't love it, because this is gonna sound crazy, but believe it or not, this set doesn't have that many artifacts. It just doesn't. I mean, Fabricate, okay, but other than that, there's really not that many artifacts, but if you can get an artifact to come onto the field, you can automatically retrieve this guy from the graveyard and put him in your hand. Now, he's a 4-2 for 4, he's easily killable, but he can definitely do some damage, so he's only, like, okay, but I put him on the list because anything that can come out of the graveyard and become a problem again is good. The only problem is you gotta pay that 4 mana again and have an artifact. Not exactly Relentless Dead, not exactly Eternal Scourge, not even close, but it's not bad. Now, usually, when I'm researching the cards for Limited, I barely even look at the two color, the mixed colors, because the, the probability of you pulling that card and then pulling really good piles in those two colors is just astronomical. I actually got Ride Down going. I pulled the card Ride Down, and I went with those colors at the last pre-release. So, I mean, it can happen. It's just really unlikely. That said, here's a list of all the really good mixed colored uncommons. By far, by an infinite margin, the best is Contraband Kingpin. It only costs two. He's a 1-4. He isn't even legendary as if you're going to pull two and then make the colors happen. In fact, if you pull two, make the colors happen. Um, Lifelink which he's going to do a lot of blocking, so that's appropriate. And whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. Don't even have to pay mana or energy for it. That is insane. This guy should probably be a rare. He is just absolutely perfect. I mean, the, the only thing that would make him better is like hexproof or flying, and that would be a little bit flying off the handle. Then there's unlicensed disintegration, which just is the funniest name ever. Um, it's an instant, it costs three, you destroy target creature. It might deal three damage to the creature's controller. I mean, that's awesome. It's a drastically improved murder. Creature removal is creature removal, people. There's almost none of it in the uncommon slot. In fact, there's almost none of it in Kaladesh. And obviously, Voltaic Brawler is basically, like, the same as a couple others that we've seen. Um, when he enters battlefield, free two energy, and then whenever he attacks, you may pay one energy. If you do, you get one one and trample until end of turn. Uh, I'm going to guess that you can only do that once, based on how it's phrased, though. I believe other cards that are phrased in the exact same manner, you can't do it multiple times. It's, it's just a response to a trigger. Still, a 4-3 for 2. I mean, come on. And then, of course, there's everybody's favorite, the color list, because no matter what colors you're running, you can throw this in your deck, and I love it. Plus, color list does tend to imply that it's an artifact, and that holds true for, if not every card, close to every card. Here's a list of all the colorless uncommons that don't suck. And that's the end of the list. Okay, just kidding. Oval Chase Dragster isn't that bad. It's a 6-1 Trample Crew 1 with haste for 4. I mean, that's kind of funny. I mean, you're going to lose it, but it's kind of funny. Drop it in, deal close to 6 damage, and probably run something over and kill it. I mean, that's that's hilarious. But the, uh, the rest are just crewable, and crewing isn't that great. It's kind of hard to like get the numbers just right, make sure you have enough on the field. It's just not a great idea. I mean, it might fit in your deck if you look at it and you're like, yes or no on throwing this in, but in general, it's just not going to work in Limited. If it does work in limited, you're probably going to end up tapping like a 5-4 to, you know, make the crew limit, and then why wouldn't you just attack with it? In constructed, you're going to just tap a bunch of crappy 1-1s you don't give a crap about, and then ram a giant, like, skyship down their throat. I should mention, though, that Chief of the Foundry is back, and he is a 2-3 three for 3. That's pretty good by itself if you need some mid-level, mid-cost creatures, I guess. And then other artifact creatures you control get plus one, plus one. There are almost none of them in Kaladesh. Uh, a lot of the straight-up creatures are like elves or artificers, that kind of thing. 
So once again, they're mostly referring to the tokens that you get from Fabricate. That's not universally true, but it is pretty true. If you're counting on pulling out Chief of the Foundry and then you're just going to swarm them with two twos, uh, you better hope there's more than one in your deck, and even then it's a little bit of a stretch to get them out every single game. But hey, Synergy, which I said I wouldn't mention, but hey, he's the king of Synergy. I will say, though, that um, Filigree Familiar is one of the best cards. It's, uh, it's freaking adorable, first of all, and it's a 2-2 two -two for 3, so pretty bad, but when it enters the battlefield, you gain 2 life, so just imagine that that's the, the extra mana on top, you know, because a 2-2 two -two should probably cost 2. So the one extra mana gets 2 life, great, but then when it dies, you draw a card. So don't feel too bad about losing this guy in combat. So you get him out turn 2, or, well, turn 3, he costs 3, oops. Chump block with him once, and then... You know, the next time they attack, take the hit, lose the two life, and you already drew a card off it. I mean, he's just the perfect little guard puppy, even though he's a fox. And that's the end of the list. Um, now, if it didn't make the list, it's usually because, yeah, it's a fantastic card in general, but it requires synergy. Like, it says, for every other creature with counters, for every other artifact, if you control more than three artifacts. So it's all these conditions that you can't necessarily guarantee are true to the extent that you could have constructed, and that's obviously what the cards are designed for. Also, with the sorting on this website, I might have just outright missed some cards, so if something was missing off the list, that might be it too. Hopefully that gives you a great outlook on uh, what to watch out for, where if you're just kind of stuck between colors and you see a couple that I mentioned, you could think, yeah, those are, those are it. Those are just exceptional, good, good cards. And if you want me to do one about the commons, let me know. It takes a hell of a lot more time, but a lot of them suck, so it's obviously a short video. So if you'd be interested in that, leave me a comment below, or just a thumbs up, or just subscribe, or pretty much do anything. I'd love you if you'd pretty much just interact in any way with my channel. Well, except leaving hate comments. In fact, if you're about to leave a comment saying, no, you're wrong, this card sucks, you're completely wrong, you misjudge cards, um, you're wrong. I am exceptionally confident in the number of pre-releases I've gone to and won that I know what I'm talking about. I'd say trust me, but clearly if you're that person, you already don't. But hey, you're the one losing your pre-release. I'll see you guys next video.